Okay, so uh, we've uh, we've put the uh, we put the Rivian up on the hoist, and I brought um, Kevin and uh, Jordan here. You've already seen these guys, you know, kind of that they're into uh, suspension systems and whatnot. So we're going to give you a quick glimpse at what I think is <laughs> the most extraordinary suspension system I've ever seen. Period. But then these guys, uh, they've seen more than I have. So anyway, we're going to move right along, and I don't know who wants to uh, jump in first, but um, yeah. seeing as uh, some of us are shorter than others. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay yeah. out here looking weird. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. lead the way in that case. Um, so just at first glance, looking under the vehicle, um, it actually is very reminiscent of the uh, old Model S when it, when it came out. So, and what I mean by that is if you look underneath, the whole subframe or the cradle is almost exclusively aluminum extrusion. So it's great in terms of quick adaptations as you're developing a program. Um, the tools are dirt cheap, right? Extrusion tools and uh, the aluminum, well, you get to save some weight and still get the structure you need. So it's all MIG welded, but going- But there's a lot of machining and yeah. MIG weld's not cheap either, so. Right. Yeah, and, and, and so like on the and Model actually, S, I don't know if this is MIG or TIG because I norm, normally for aluminum, I'd want TIG welding, which again, um, adds a whole new dimension to cost. Right, yeah, and to your point, Sandy, uh, vehicles that launch with something like this uh, typically end up with uh, a die casting, permanent mold cast, something like that yeah. to replace it just from a, uh, a volume and yeah, reduction of weld for sure perspective. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, getting underneath it, taking a look at the suspension systems, Clearly, there's a lot of travel. If it's not very evident on the video, we were just commenting before we started filming, the delta height between like the nominal undersurface of the body and where the wheel is, is probably second to none. So the downward the overall yeah. suspension travel is, is very impressive. Um, and so on this, they have both air and hydraulic systems. Um, so that's a, uh, that's quite a packaging exercise to get both those lines routed throughout the entire vehicle and then to have it function. So, hats so off to we them. have to also mention that we did take off uh, this front skid plate so we could have a look at what's going on here. We're definitely not going, I'm not letting these guys uh, attack my car with wrenches, but uh, I do trust uh, Andrew to take off uh, a couple of things. He'll put them back on. Sure. Yeah. With respect even with, to the suspension travel, like this reminds me a lot of uh, like an M998 Humvee, your high mobility multi-wheel vehicle, I believe. The real one. Yeah, the, the real uh, one. Yeah. So, and that's a vehicle that has, um, you know, the CVs are packaged up, the differentials are, are packed up tight into the frame, the brakes are up here. So in a very similar fashion with how these CVs are evenly biased, and um, that vehicle also has portal hubs. So the CVs come, they would come into the top here of their, their hub. And then it's essentially, essentially a set of planetary gears that, that drive the wheels. But when you look at the ground clearance, if, if you were to look at a Humvee and this, it's very, very similar to like the overall profile of how flat the bottom of this vehicle is. And that's a vehicle that was, you know, packaged around, um, you know, having the mobility and not necessarily around like you know, people's creature comfort, you know, sitting in the backseat of a Humvee, you're like this. So uh, there's a lot of compromises in respect to that to where the powertrain is packaged, but this is probably the only thing I've ever seen that has kind of a similar profile of how flat the bottom of the vehicle is um, and then how far, especially in the rear, how much down travel that this vehicle does have. And, and you can really only do that successfully, if you will, by moving all of these articulation points further inboard. So if you were to look at a conventional automotive application where you've got uh, essentially an SLA, short arm, long arm front suspension like this, you would see, relatively speaking, these inboard pivot points on both the half shaft and the control arms themselves significantly further outboard. So by moving them inboard, if you look at this CV axle, this joint here, by moving that inboard, you lengthen your CV axles and what that does is it reduces the severity or the tightness of the angles on the, the joints for the, the half shaft. So less articulation at full travel allows you to, you know, enabled by the length of it, enables you to have more travel. So and you can definitely see if you were to look like underneath Eric, like how narrow these points are going down the vehicle. And essentially this is, the long control arm is like the only way to get travel out of independent or independent rear suspension. So if you look at the, 
the Ram TRX, the Ford Raptor, all those vehicles, they get, they get wider for a series of reasons, but one of them is because they're, they're going longer with their, their control arms to get the travel because of the inherent like, architectural aspects of these type of systems. So they cover it with you know, wide body kits and things of that nature, but that's what they want. You know, you can, if you drop down you know, those mounting points, you kind of compromise um, your ground clearance and you're not really doing anything for some of the joint considerations for your CVs. That I, I just noticed that this A-arm is touching the um... Uh, the extruding. Touching the extruded stuff here. Uh, I've never seen that before either. It's uh, close. Here's There's a little bit of an air Here's gap. a millimeter on this side, but it's on an angle, so yeah. my guess is that it's tighter in there. I, I Tight it seems to be the word. It's huge and tight at the same time. And by the way, I should mention that Kevin uh, is in the Army Reserve. That's why he kind of knows <laughs> a lot about uh, what's going on. The guard, so, it's a little different. Oh, the guard, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. And, and Sandy, in terms of clearances, you see that evident here as well. So Eric, if you point to the upper control arm next to the, the bellows, so it's that kind of like accordion shaped cover around the, uh, the air shock or the air strut, you can see how close the upper control arm and the top of the knuckle are to interfering with that. So. Yes, Andy, you're right. They, they are not giving their, themselves much room for error in terms of build process, but if you can do it consistently, then you can have clearances like this. Yeah, yeah. A miss is as good as a mile. Right. The other thing we should mention too is that some of these, uh, some of these covers are made out of carbon fiber, I think. Uh, it certainly looks like it, and uh, I haven't seen any, any markings, but uh, this stuff is uber strong. This is, the battery would be underneath here. Yeah, it's interesting. So as you go back, um, they've got some steel, some thinner steel shields in the front. Probably as you go to the leading edge of the battery to protect for uh, stone impingement or just protecting the face of the battery in general. Then they've got an aero cover, which is also providing a small air gap, right? If I push up with my thumb, you can see there's an air gap between that and the bottom plate of the battery. The bottom plate of the battery is carbon fiber, right? So it's multi-layer. You can see right here, I don't know if you can tell Eric, the, uh, the sealant coming down from the top of that carbon fiber there, right? So it's giving them most definitely some sheer strength and rigidity in the body. Carbon fiber is not gonna give a whole lot. So if you talk about uh, global or modal stiffness on a body in white structure, this is a unibody. This is gonna be hugely advantageous to that overall body stiffness number. Yeah, that's maybe something we didn't mention. This is a unibody, it's not like most pickup trucks this size. Uh, most of them would be, uh, would have a frame, uh, but this one uh, is a little different. Um, so let's go and have a look at the, uh, the rear suspension a bit. So um, if you look here, you can see that you've got, these are the two, the two motors for the rear. Um, and then after that, we started looking at hmm, amazing stuff again to, to this rear suspension. Yeah, it's interesting. Now going to the rear, it looks like a, uh, either a low pressure, haven't looked at it too much, either a low pressure um, permanent mold casting or sand casting, probably the low pressure uh, for the, one of this, the side node on the subframe. Um, so by doing that, in contrast to the front, you'll note that there's hardly any TIG welding, right? Only where the extrusions meet either other extrusions or the sand casting itself, but they're getting a ton of feature integration there. And plus, as this is kind of the nexus for two of your fore and aft control arm points, there's a lot of load being transferred to this. So you get a really high modulus from a big casting like this. So it's really good in terms of suspension dynamics, just to manage all that and tune your suspension accordingly. Um, yeah, and as Sandy mentioned, you've got your two motors here. Looks like they went with a uh, probably a PUR or an EVA foam. So it's polyurethane. Um, EVA is, a, is another blend that gives you a little bit different characteristics. And then they're, they're molding into that some harder plastics. We haven't got a material designation on it, but they would do that for two things. And Eric, if you come over here, you can probably see a better view. If I peel it back with my finger. Right, so you've got a hard layer, and then you've got a thinner foam layer on the outside, and then a thick layer on the inside. 
So that inner layer does two things. One, it gives the part stiffness. So as you go to wrap the motors or as you go to install it, it stays stable or in position as you go to deck it. Um, otherwise, it's gonna be kind of flopping around like a wet noodle. It'll be difficult to manage, that's one thing. But more importantly, that harder layer on the inside, uh, general rule of thumb, the more dense a material is, the higher the frequency of noise it's gonna cancel out. The less dense the part is, the lower the frequency. So as you go through an RPM range in an electric motor, you're gonna have a whole range of frequencies that you're trying to cancel out, meaning so the driver doesn't pick up on it. So they've definitely put some, uh, some effort into tuning that wrap and making sure they're trying to address a whole range of frequencies. I will tell you one thing, in driving this, <clears throat> it has more motor noise than, uh, than the Model S or, or the 3 or the Y. And quite frankly, I like it. I, I, this is a truck and it should have some noise. Um, so, uh, so I believe that, I believe this is, um, I think that what they did was they, oh, there we go. It doesn't like, uh, it doesn't like the fact that I'm underneath it. I think it figures that I'm being crushed by the car or something. But, but I, I, uh, I do like the fact that, that it makes, uh, it makes a little bit of noise. It makes it sound like, you know, you're going as fast as you think you're going. And speaking of going fast, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but we're going to put a link to um, we're going to put a link to the uh, uh, little speed test that somebody had zero to sixty or whatever uh, between uh, a Rivian. Um, what's the uh, the Raptor Ranger, and Ranger, and Ranger, and, Ranger. and it, yeah. Yeah. So I'm pretty impressed. Um, uh, this thing basically cleaned uh, cleaned everyone's clock. Well, it's and it's a pickup truck. I mean, there's got to be a bunch of sad people out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting you mentioned the, the motor noise, Sandy. I'd be really curious to see how they arrived at that decision. If you're saying there's a, a substantial amount of feedback that you're getting in the cabin. Not substantial. No, it, it just lets you know that there's a motor working. Sure. And, and quite frankly, uh, when we were for Jag when Jaguar was part of Ford and we were talking about tuning the Jaguar sound or the Harley sound when we worked with them or any other, you know, any other big engine, um, we wanted to have something that was distinctive, something that let you know that this is a Jag or this is a Harley or something. But this has got a distinctive sound that is not unpleasant at all. It just makes you think this thing's really hauling. Well, it's yeah. interesting they went with a, you know, on the point of isolation, NVH, or feedback in the cabin, they've got a hard-mounted rear cradle. So it's, um, it's, th there's nothing wrong with that, but it is something that we see less common in all-wheel drive unibodies, specifically BEVs. If you were to look at all the battery electric vehicles on the market, the I-PACES, the Model S, the e-trons, the Polestars, all ID4s, they would have, by and large, most of them would have a cast slash extruded aluminum rear subframe or cradle, but they would all be isolated to the body. What, what I mean by hard mounted versus isolated is if you look at these bolts where they go through the casting and into the body structure itself, so right here, you'll note that there is no bushed rubber joint in between the cradle and the body structure. So it is truly hard mounted. So they're not damping anything or isolating anything between the subframe and the body. But uh, obviously they'll but isolate the motor itself. Yeah, right? but at the end of the day, if you're if you're looking at rigidity going up or over rocks or even into the mud, I want this thing as stiff as I can get. Yep. So I would suppose so that it's, it's similar to that. Yeah. Just because one, it's a pickup truck. Right. So you're not necessarily sitting directly over this. So any yeah. noise coming up is going into a large volume anyway, which would be yeah. the bed itself. Yeah. And the suspension clearly has a lot of, there's a lot of calories and man hours into this. Yeah. So uh, they can use it to their full potential and get the, overall performance of probably having a fixed cradle you know, in the rear. Yeah, yeah I'd hate to get the ED&D bill for, <laughs> for all the development on this. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, quite a marvel. I will tell you, um, I've said this like about 40 times since I got here today. This is quite frankly the beefiest um, rear suspension I've ever... So there's the beefiest front suspension. This one's... The rear suspension is huge as well. Um, 
again, this uh, this has uh, quite a bit of um, quite a bit of kneeling capability. It's all it's fully extended right now, but this thing will crunch up to about six inches. So um, this is really uh, really necessary for this kind of a this kind of movement and this kind mm -hmm. of a car. But I will tell you, I. I, I know it was a big deal for me to move from a Jeep to this, but after looking at it and driving around for about a week, it's really not hard to fall in love with this and, uh, and say goodbye to your old buddy. Um, this is really, really, really a nice car. It's wicked fast. I, I took it up a 40, at least a 40 degree angle, um, slow, and I tried that with the Jeep and that didn't really work out too well for me. Um, that the new Jeep. Um, I I really I really think that Rivian's got a hell of a car here or truck here. This is uh, if you're an off roader, it's going to be hard for you to say, oh, I wouldn't want one of these, or I'd like to go back to, you know, an old Jeep or something like that. There's no way that, no way. And and quite frankly. Um, Sue, my wife, and by the way, um, my wife is kind of extraordinary, a little bit extraordinary. She is an engineer. She graduated from GMI. And then she went back and she got a master's in manufacturing engineering. Then she got an MBA. And then she got a PhD in engineering. So when she says, oh, I really like it, uh, that's code for... Um, uh, she's used all the uh, all the talents that she gathered up through all these years to uh, uh, to give her opinion. Um, it's not just uh, you know um, uh, a casual comment. Yeah. So anyway, we're very glad. I paid quite a bit of money for this thing, but um, I think it's worth every penny. And I probably this could be the last vehicle I ever buy. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool to finally uh, get underneath one and take a look at it, yeah. you know. And it's it's clear that a lot, as Kevin mentioned, right, a lot of calories and ED and D engineering design and development went into this thing. You know, even if you if you look at the half shafts, right, we were talking about them earlier. You'll notice that the diameter changes from the inboard side. There's a step down right where my finger is. There's another step down right here, and so there's it's variable thickness. Right, so you want a large diameter to manage the torque. And then as you move outboard and as the packaging condition changes, they change the diameter of the half shaft. So people like, uh, you know, we've seen people left hand, right hand on the six gen Camaro go hollow on one side, solid on the other to manage um, <coughs> axle wind up and different things. But to see them do it from uh, w what it appears to be as a packaging um, condition scenario is, is good to see. They're, they're pulling the, uh, you know, major engineering lovers, not just the simple stuff. So mm. it's very cool. So anyway, I think uh, wrapping it up is that I'm pretty happy that I, I bought this. I'm glad it'd be nice if we could tear it down, but um, I'm glad that I bought it. I'm keeping it for myself. Like I say, I think this may be the last vehicle I ever buy So uh, for me. So anyway, with that, I'd like to wrap it up. Uh, thanks for watching Monroe Live here on the uh, Rivian uh, look at uh, the vehicle kind of thing and no, I'm not going to let anybody tear it down any further. Anyhow, thanks a lot guys. We'll see you. Thank you.